Welcome to the Gig Boss Podcast, where musicians go to talk about artistry and industry. My name's Adam Meckler, and it's my mission to get you the tools to have a thriving career in music. Today, we've got Eric Jacobson on the show. Eric Jacobson is the fearless leader of Mama Dig Down's brass band. Mama Dig Down's has been around for 30 years. 30 years. How do you keep a band together for 30 years? We're going to talk about that a little bit. They've got their 10th album coming out, uh, a record full of Michael Jackson covers, all of which are arranged by the great Nat McIntosh, who is also the arranger and composer for Youngblood Brass Band. So if you're into Youngblood's music, there's some taste of that, some flavor of that on the new Mama Dig Down's Brass Band record. And Eric Jacobson is this really important figure in that whole scene because he's the one that originally brought some of those Youngblood guys down to New Orleans, introduced them to the music when they were in high school or they were like just finishing high school and he was maybe in his early 20s as a social worker in Madison. And as you may know, my history as a musician, as a touring artist, is intertwined with all of this as well because I started playing with Young Blood Brass Men maybe eight or nine years ago, toured all over the world with them, some of my most memorable experiences on the road. I really got into this music because of the Jack Brass Band, a band in Minneapolis led by Mike Olander, who's really this like encyclopedia of brass band music. I'm very grateful my, for my experiences with Jack Brass. That was kind of the catalyst for me getting the gig for Youngblood Brass Band because I had that foundational knowledge of brass band music. I had kind of a foundation of tunes that I had to learn from recordings. And in the interview, I say some things about Jack Brass that are maybe less than awesome and i want to preface all of that with that i'm grateful for the experiences that i got through that band and the opportunities that came out of it all right i want to tell you about the gig boss app the gig boss app is a way for you to organize your busy freelance music and band leader career if you're a band you can form that little group in the app and then you can create all your gigs in the app and you can all be on the same page both in terms of scheduling and in terms of finances And if you're a freelancer and you play in a dozen bands and maybe you lead some of your own, you can organize all of that information so that at the end of the year when you go to tax time, you can see how much money you made with all the various different bands you play in, in your past gigs tab, and all that good stuff. We're adding a whole bunch more stuff right now as we go. We're really just getting started. So if you download the app and then give us some feedback that will help us shape it in the way that you want We are considering lots of things right now. We are considering lots of things. So send me some emails. I've gotten some emails from people recently who listen to the podcast, and I very much appreciate that feedback. I'm reading it. I'm filing it away. I'm sometimes sending that stuff to our developers, and they're working on it. All right? So we're uh, we're rolling. We're rolling. Now, how do you keep a band together for 30 years? Well, here's my conversation with Eric Jacobson, leader of Mama Dig Down's Brass Band. So hey, uh, how are things going? Thanks for hanging uh, here. Great, yeah. Um, thanks for uh, thanks for having me on the on the pod. Yeah, totally. So what does um, are you like? Where are you from? Are you from Wisconsin? No, I'm from Minneapolis. Okay, um, so how does like Dig Downs is based in Madison? Is that right? <clears throat> yes. Uh, so here's how it happened. Um, I grew up in South Minneapolis. Um, went to Hale, Field, Anthony, Washburn, um, and my sophomore year at Washburn, uh, a uh, a musician, my band teacher, uh, moved from Detroit, Donald Washington, mm. and became the band teacher at Washburn. Um, and he gave me my first Dirty Dozen record. Um, so, um, and, and a lot of records, actually every day at lunch, we used to, um, we used to go up to his office and he had a massive vinyl collection and he was playing, um, first time he exposed us to John Coltrane and, um, you know, Miles Davis, Lester Young. And then he, he was really into the avant-garde. So he was playing us like Roscoe Mitchell records and Anthony Braxton, wow. a bunch of really out there stuff. And then he would also loan us these records and send us home with, um, with records. And so one of those albums that he, um, let me bring home was a dirty dozen. My feet can't fill me now record. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, I fell in love with it. So we performed some of those songs in the jazz band with him, but that's when the brass band bug bit. And, uh, so then I went to, um, university of Wisconsin, Madison, as, okay. as a music as a music major and it was there that i uh that uh, started mama dig down's brass band so what so, so what what year are we talking uh what, like when did you go to college 1990 1990 okay yeah 
So there were like it's like Rebirth two. was just getting started. Rebirth was like yep. late eighties, right? Yep. There was I think there were two. I think there were like two Rebirth records at the time. Okay. Um, and uh, and then a couple Dirty Dozen records at wow. the time. So um, yeah, and we just and I fell in love with the music, and then I met um, Rock Oli um, at the School of Music in in Richard Davis's um, Black Music Ensemble class, cool. and we just decided we needed to just start a brass band. So were you playing um, tuba all along? Is that what you started on? Yeah. Yep. Okay. My grandfather was a tuba player. Um, and both of his, both of his sons who are my uncles played also. So, um, actually I still play his sousaphone that he played, um, in Albert Lee high school way back in the, way back in the early forties. Okay. And that's, uh, so your, your band director in high school, that that's Kevin Washington's dad, right? Is that yeah, Kevin Washington's yep. dad? Okay. Yep. So do you know Kevin at all? You ever cross yeah. paths? Oh yeah. In fact, we had a little court, we had a little quartet called Tri Ties and Sticks. Uh -huh. Um, back my sophomore year. And I think Kevin was a seventh grader. He was an absolute monster back then. Yeah, yeah. Uh and and uh it was a tenor trumpet um tuba and drum set and so we used to we used to play little gigs we sometimes sneak onto the uh, lake carry at band shell at like midnight in the summers to do little gigs here and there cool yeah so when was the first time that you went down to to new orleans and like experienced i mean the first time i went down there it was like this i mean the truly mind-blowing experience like to, yes. to see the culture around brass band music to hear the trumpet <clears throat> players in the brass band setting like that was yes opened up a whole world of shit for me like oh you can you can play trumpet like that like i didn't even it wasn't even on my radar that you could play like that i mean it's like i had right. listened to lewis armstrong and people that came from new orleans i was a big like nicholas payton fan and yep. terrence blanchard and stuff but like i didn't there's a whole other side and I'm sure those guys grew up playing that stuff and went and, you know, but like yeah. they didn't play like, they don't play like the brass band trumpet players play really, right. you know, like there's such velocity and that's like, it was completely like blew, blew my mind wide open. I, I know. And even, and even like young kids down there just blow and the Trump, they hold their horns up and they just project, you know, yep. because that's what they're, you know, they're just, just from a real young age are playing out in the street. And so that's what they do. Yeah. Um, so the first time that we went to New Orleans, let's see, so I was in school in Madison starting in like 1990, and it was like 1995 that we started, no, 1993, I'm losing track. Yeah. I know it's almost 30 years ago now. Yeah. Um, we started the band and we recorded our first album, and then we thought, okay, we better, we better get down to New Orleans. So... Um, we packed up in the band van and went down to New Orleans and just um, listened, went to the Funky Butt and went to Donna's and just <clears throat> ran all around um, listening to Algiers Brass Band, the Treme Brass Band. We caught New Birth, Rebirth, yep. um, the Soul Rebels. And then while we were down there, we gave our um, CD to the owner of Donna's Bar. Um, we gave it to Donna and Charlie and we said, oh, we're, we have this brass band up in Wisconsin. And... Um, and so um, we just chit chatted with them. And then a few months later, we went back down. We piled into the van again, and they had put the album on their jukebox hmm. and said that uh, our recording of Mo Better Blues was uh, one of their favorite songs. So they wow. fell in love with that song and then, um, and then uh, put it on their jukebox and then said, Would you ever be interested in coming down and gigging here? And we're like, Uh, what? <laughs> Because Donna's was like, Donna's was kind of at the center of the brass band renaissance at the time. Like they were booking yep. brass bands like six nights a week. Wow. Um, and on the weekends they were doing two bands. So like they would have, and I think, I think the Soul Rebels played Thursday night. And then on the weekends they would have two, two brass bands a night. So like that was the band, that was the bar that was booking brass bands. So for us to like get that call was like, it was like, we kind of freaked out and it was also just like you know, an honor and, and pretty sweet for us, you know, for us to have that opportunity. Yeah. It must, must have felt a, a bit like you're being welcomed into the circle too, in some way, culturally, yes. just like, Hey, yeah, you belong this, this sound. It's like, you're, you, you've, you've studied the sound you you're, you're, you're getting it obviously and come down and play. I mean, that's like, that seems like the biggest compliment you could get. Yes. Um, exactly. And, um, we had some, 
we we got to meet so many cats like all the brass band guys that would be in there um and then they had a jam session on monday night that we would go to that bob french led and um you know i remember branford being there for the jam session and hearing him um wow. Then, you know, Leroy Jones and Nicholas Payton yep. would come through, Devell Crawford, um, Big Sam, all these guys would come in, um, Trombo and Shorty, and we were just like soaking it all up. Um, wow. And sometimes, sometimes one of us would get the gumption to jump on stage and, uh, and to jam with whoever was up there. Um, but it was a lot of listening and that, and, and that was a lot of listening for a lot of years. Yeah. Yeah. Which is key to, to learn in the language. And I hear and that man our like, ass kicked a lot. Yeah, man. Yeah, the first couple of times I went down there, I was, remember getting my ass kicked pretty good. Sitting yeah. in and, you know, sat in, in the Sunday second line. Just, just like was walking with the parade and somebody saw my trumpet case and was like, "Come on, man." You know. It's like yes. did, didn't know any of the tunes. It was my first time down there. I had just started playing with Jack Brass. Yep. Uh, but man, those experiences is like they really stick with me uh, in terms of like how you learn the music on the fly and, and like stylistically and feel like those things are so important. And like when I play with you, it's like I've played with a lot of New Orleans style tuba players. When I play with you, it like feels so good. Mm -hmm. And it's like, man, I could hear that, uh, that New Orleans flavor, the depth of it in your playing. I appreciate that. You know, I think New Orleans, um, I think New Orleans is like unlike any other music scene in that it is welcoming if you take it seriously and you're you're sincere about that. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, I know you've spent time in New York and I have too, and it's not like that at all. It's mm -hmm. kind of it's it doesn't have they don't you know they're not they they don't really uh, see outside musicians like you know don't welcome them with open arms to the extent that New Orleans does they're not even close yeah. so once the brass band players down there saw that we were like serious about it and devoted to it and curious about it then it was like you know they were very welcoming and and um, you know teaching us and kicking our ass and mm -hmm. all these things to make us better players. That's super cool. So what were you doing? Like, I want to back up. What were you doing when you finished college? You, were you still in Madison? Were you working a job? Were you just playing would, music? No, I was working a job. Um, that would have been in like 96. I was working a job as a social worker for Dane County okay. um, with kids with juvenile offenders. And like we had a lot of gigs, Dig Downs had a lot of gigs. We bought, I mean, we, you know, we bought a van and we traveled a lot and we, you know, we hit the festivals and clubs and, um, you know, would pile in vans and go out to New York and play, or we, you know, make, um, two or three times a year, we'd go to new Orleans, um, mm -hmm. always during Mardi Gras, always during jazz fest, sometimes one other time. So, um, yeah, I was working a full-time job and then also just like playing a lot with the band. Wow. So at some point you brought a couple of young kids down to new Orleans who ended up starting young blood brass band which which is a band i plan it's you're sort of like a legend in in their circle <laughs> the, you know the, there's a tune on pax volume my album called eric owen that's titled after after uh -huh. you and these these guys talk about you like when we're on the road and we play that tune they'll talk about you being hugely influential on them and so like a like these were like high like, they were like high schoolers right like how did yes. you convince their parents to let you bring them down I, to new orleans like what <laughs> To be honest, I have no idea how the how and why those parents let us. I mean, you know, we were probably I was rocking myself for probably like twenty seven at the time, yeah, uh, twenty five. I don't know the math, but anyway, yes, we brought them down to New Orleans. I think you know we had probably six, five or six guys who we picked up while they were still in high school. Um, uh, and and they were cool i mean maybe it helped that i was a social worker and they just sort of trusted me that i would take care of their son yeah sure <laughs> but you know it is really if you're like 18 years old or 17 years old and then you know you travel with a band down to new orleans and you experience all the things that you mentioned about hearing it's like those cats are hooked at that point. I yep. mean, that's yep. a big, that's a, that's a big impact for, for young players. I mean, it is for me. Um, but you know, maybe even more so if they're in high school and they had never not, you know, these guys were, you know, they weren't gigging a lot. Cause if you're in high school, you're not gigging a lot. So, um, yeah. And honestly, I love the energy that young cats bring. I mean, I say that like I was an old cat back then, Yeah, but, um, 
like a couple few weeks ago, we went and played at the Brass Fest out in um, Asheville, hmm. North Carolina, and we brought two young guys who are starting to play with us. And I love their energy. It's like mm-hmm. they don't complain about the accommodations. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> They, they're just like there and their ears are wide open and they're just soaking it all in. So like, I, I definitely like, I definitely like having, um, you know, young guys around. Yeah. In my first, my first few tours with young blood, it was like, it was interesting to see the vibe of, of people. It's like, they didn't complain a ton, but it was, there was definitely some of that going on. Mm-hmm. And like, we'd go to a bar and people would be like, Oh, you're in a band. Like what band is it? And they'd be like, whatever, nothing. It's nothing. And I'd be like, what are you talking about? It's nothing. It's so blood brass band. Turn that shit on the right. You know, <laughs> yes. like, turn that shit on. Let's go. I love it. You know, but it was just like, it was funny. It's like, I definitely, I was definitely the one with that young guy energy on the yeah. road with those guys. And they were kind of like, they were getting a little bit jaded maybe in right. some aspects that having happens. gone you know having gone hard for so many years i know in the early 2000s they went i think they did like 10 months a year on the road mm-hmm. uh for a little while to like build up their thing but did you guys did you ever consider like quitting your gig and just being like let's go <laughs> let's go hard with this you know y- yes but i think that I feel like because a few of us, like Jeff Mattern, mm-hmm. actually, he, he, that's it. so. He's kind of interesting. He's kind of interesting because when he graduated from when he graduated from college, he did move to New Orleans and got a job because uh, he's he's an engineer, um, and he got a job at a tie manufacturer down in New Orleans. Huh. Um, and he also was playing in the Hot Eight full time at that point. So no shit, um, I didn't realize he played in Hot Eight. Yeah. So um, wow. And then and then he was getting all these other calls. Like I mean, he tells me stories of like getting hired to play with New Birth in a second line, and then none of the other trumpets show up. So it's like Jeff Matter and fresh in from Madison, um, you know being the trumpet player on a second line and like how much, you know, how big that was and how it made him just like, you know, take it to another level. Um, but so he was down there for maybe, I think about a year and a half, um, playing, he was, like I said, he played, um, trumpet in, uh, in the hot eight and then just was like a, you know, a freelance cat down there. But most of us have, because we met, we all met sort of at around the same age in and we all sort of graduated at the same time guys just started getting jobs some of the guys in the band are full-time musicians yeah but we never really we never really like considered that seriously about like quitting those day gigs and going on the road and you know it's it's interesting because for a long time i sort of had a complex about that and i felt like if I don't do this as like my full-time thing, then it must mean that I'm not that serious about it or I'm not as good as the cats. And then I was down and then I was in New Orleans um, talking to Bob French, um, who is one of our mentors, um, drummer who, you know, came up on the music and, yeah. um, and uh, you know, played with Fats Domino and every, every possible jazz legend you can think of. And he, he himself, of course, is a legend. But Bob, over breakfast at Lil Dizzy's Cafe, told me that the whole time he was working, he, was also, he also worked at the post office. Hmm. And it kind of made me think, like, if Bob French has a day gig and he has no shame about that, I can have a day gig and not feel any shame about that. So it sort of like turned my, it yeah. kind of flipped the switch with me. Um, and I also feel like for me, it provides balance um, because, you know, I work with kids and I love that and that's my passion. And that is also really hard and drives me crazy. And then I can, I can turn to music and kind of like switch gears. So that's been a good balance for me personally. Yeah. I just talked about this in an episode on the podcast about different, the way that different, like, you know, a music career is as unique as each individual musician, you know, mm-hmm. it's like everybody's career looks differently. And because you have a day job doesn't necessarily mean that you can't play at an extremely high level and, and, you know, really, really dig into the music and right do it the right way. It's like, there's a lot of people doing that right now. And, and then a lot, a lot of times 
those people are able to really focus on the one thing in music that they love. Right. Whereas if you're doing it full time, like I did for 10 years in Minneapolis, you're spread really thin because you're yes. like doing all the polka gigs and all the, you know, you can't, you whatever can't say funk no. things. You can't say no. <laughs> yeah. And a long time I couldn't say no. And it, it wasn't until I started teaching more that it was like, all right, I'm going to say no to funeral gigs with Jack Brass Band because those make me sad. And I'm going to say mm-hmm. no to, you know, like the certain gigs I like, yeah. just didn't want to play. And I, so I was done playing weddings. I was done playing private parties. It's like, unless it was really crazy bread, then it was like, all right, I'll right. do that. But, right. you know, for the most part, and there's always that scale that you're like, the money's really crazy good versus the music sucking. And like, you know, it's like, does the money outweigh the music? Um, but, uh, yeah, man, it's like, that's a lot of t- people that have those day jobs. It's like they can focus. I know a lot of people, you know, Brandon Wozniak works a day job and he's like one of the baddest yep. saxophone players on the planet. And it's yeah. like, dude's doing his selling woodwinds or whatever. It's in music. It's like in the music scene. Right. Right. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of uh, a lot of that, and I'm uh, I'm for it, you know. Yeah. But it's hard. <laughs> and then you throw kids into the mix, and then it's a whole nother level. Yeah, totally, totally. And you got Edward playing a little bit, yep. man. I remember Edward, when he was, he was Ed- sitting in on things. Yep, Edward plays, and uh, although he just switched from the he was playing tuba and trombone, and now he's uh, now he's on percussion. So um, I'm just kind of like. I, I like that he's exploring different things and my daughter Helen is gonna um, she's just kind of eyeing the alto saxophone so yeah um, cool. we listened to Cannibal when we went to bed last night so um, yeah he's starting to plant some seeds it's interesting actually your audio is no it's not buzzing anymore never mind it was buzzing for a second okay um, man it's interesting because I we I brought my kids to this the symphony here uh the other night and it was a whole show and and it went late and it's like they stayed awake the whole time they listened the whole time they're four and seven you know awesome and like it, it i was it's i think we underestimate what kids can handle in terms yes. of like a, it's like we develop these like vanilla tastes and then anything that's <laughs> o- close to avant-garde it's like we're like oh no that's too weird my kids aren't gonna like that and it's right. like we've been listening to there's this great uh sunny Rollins record i hadn't heard before called Our Man in Jazz and it's got Don Cherry on oh. trumpet and it's like in the sixties and it's weird it's like weird. It's out, man. It's like out. Yeah. It's the out it's probably the outest I've heard Sonny Rollins play on anything. Mm-hmm. And my kids listen to it. We we would listen to it every night at dinner. My kids they don't it's like they don't say anything. They, they'll d- bop around, dance a little bit. But they don't say like that's weird. Like they've never made yes. a comment like that. That's not right. something that's even in their Right. You it's know. almost it's only weird until someone tells them it's weird. Totally, man. Totally. <laughs> yeah, I love That's that. That's fascinating to me, man. That's, and I'm trying to get Augie to play a little bit because I've got a brass band here at MTU and I'll put uh-huh. sticks in his hands and stand him in front of a, a snare drum and he'll just kind of, he's a little like shy to, to play, but it's like mm-hmm. I know he could hang. So I'm just waiting for that moment where he. Yes, let's do this. Yeah, I remember Edward just being like, raw, it's just like <laughs> blasting. <laughs> I know he he um from a from a very young age he would just jump up on stage and play like he you know he just played what he felt and that was that was it I remember the first time that um I had Donald Washington um come to a show of ours dig downs at uh, the Parkway Theater and and Edward was sitting in Edward was probably like seven and uh, Donald um left a voicemail on my phone the next morning saying he appreciated coming to the show and he said but you got to tell that boy to blow out (laughs) (laughs) so yeah edward you got to play loud if you're with the brass band you got to play loud and that's blow out baby you got to play right from donald washington from the source yes Uh, okay so i figured it out when you're talking it's buzzing a little bit so do you want to like mess with your input a little bit oh yeah okay just to be sure it's not Sorry about that. Is that any? Is that the same? It's the same. Yeah, it's still buzzing. It's better now when you're touching it. But okay, I'll just keep my hand on it. Yeah. Uh, cool. So dig downs now. You've got a ton of records. How many records have you done in almost thirty years? Nine. Nine. Yeah. Cool. And Um, over the course of almost thirty years. So like, how do you keep a band together for thirty years? Like you, you must have dealt with, you know personality things ego things it's like musicians there's always going to be yes something uh so how do you break through moments like that and keep well, going 
yeah, it's it's a really good question. I mean, um, it it is sort of it. I will definitely say that it's sort of a point of pride for us in that you know we have kept the band going for. 30 years um wow. one of the things is that um the core of the band is like they're awesome guys and um they we enjoy spending time together um we always have um the music is good um and so there's like you know it it, it comes back to those two things um the other secret the other secret sauce that we have is that um is that rock and i co-lead it mm -hmm. and the the guys in the band kind of call us mom and dad um <laughs> and i'm and i i think they think of me as the mom and i sort of <laughs> tend more to the emotional needs of the band sure uh, that's sort of my angle with things anyway you know being a social worker mm -hmm. and dad can be the authoritarian kind of strict guy um and he's real good at keeping the books i mean if it were just up to me this band would have been shipwrecked years and years ago mm. um but rock has a banker's mind and so he kind of tends to things and make sure that people are getting paid the right amount and um and then also is just you know sometimes if i get too worked up about something he just tells me to chill out and i do so i it's been really helpful for us to have um to to have a partnership to 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 do that um i think the other thing is that it has required a lot of flexibility on our parts to you know uh kind of like roll with the way that things you know roll with where and and kind of meet people where they're at uh you know um whether it's like people going through periods of depression or people moving away or people yeah. struggling with their personal life like we've just like i think we just have this like flexibility to just like let people do their thing support them love them and then when they're like in a place you know just to come back or um i mean we do kind of say once a dig down brother always a dig down brother and that's true um i think we've only let like one person go out of the band and they came back so mm -hmm. in terms of like firing them so um and they came back how did that happen did, did they up their game or they and it wasn't it wasn't a musical thing um because the biggest thing for us is that we just want guys that take it seriously mm -hmm. and love it. Um, and through that, they become great players. Um, right. No. So, it, so we just needed, we just needed them to like show us that they were making changes and they got it together. And then we, we, we welcomed them back. So, um, but you know, in 30 years, we've only had to do that once. So, wow. um, or one and a half times, maybe. <laughs> so how many, like, how many of the guys now are, like, Jeff has been with you for a really long time. It sounds like yeah, after coming back from New Orleans, or no, he was. He, so, so that was one thing. Like, even when he was in New Orleans, like, we still considered him part of the band because there would be some shows that, like, we would fly him up for, okay. um, some of our bigger profile shows, um, or we would, you know, play with him when he was. Um, uh, down in new orleans actually it's kind of funny there was one there was there was a we played a brass band a brass band blowout uh that was organized by walter of the, and ursella the stooges yep, yep and um it was the soul rebels new birth rebirth stooges young blood and dig down and how holy smokes it Man. was like an all day, all night brass band blowout, and it was like a contest. It was all a contest. legendary New Orleans bands, and then two bands from Madison, Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's fucking yes. incredible, man. That's incredible. Yes. So, um, so the thing that it was awesome being part of it, but the thing that sucked was we, our trombone players couldn't come to the show. Mm. They couldn't come to New Orleans. And we didn't, even, when we went down to New Orleans, we didn't even know about this thing. Like we were asked to do it once we got down there. And okay. then Jeff, cause he was playing on the hot eight at the time, Jeff chose to blow at the hot eight. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and I get it, but at the same oh. time, <laughs> what we had on stage was the rhythm section, tuba, bass, drum, snare drum, two tenors and a trumpet. Hmm. And we blew our hearts out. And then we just got totally got crushed by all the other bands. Yeah. <laughs> we were like the little engine that could. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so yeah, he chose he chose Team Hot Eight, which is understandable, but it kind of. I was going to say, I, I get that decision. I mean, yeah, it's probably the decision I make too if I'm in his shoes. Yes, of course. 
Um, but I can also understand why that would be frustrating. Yes. But, you know, we kept him in the band when he was down there. But, no, he, he started with us maybe two years into the band or four, three years into the band. This is all kind of – it's all kind of murky. But, yeah. Um, but of the, the two original members, Rock and me. Yeah. Um, and then uh, next came Jeff. And then after that, it's like Nat – I mean, I don't remember when guys that, were joining, but the he's one of the dudes you took down in New Orleans, right? When he was in high school. Yep. Yeah. So it's like, and then Nat's obviously become Nat McIntosh. People listening, he's become one of the biggest names in tuba land. Yes. Both, both classical and jazz. Uh, tuba player for Young Blood for a long time. Arranges all that music. Um, so yeah. his brother, his brother Ben, was actually in the band first. Oh, that's right. Um, I met his brother. Yeah, and so then when Ben was going to go off, so we we found we got Ben when he was in high school, and then when um, Ben was going to go off to college, we knew Nat played tuba, and we were like, Nat, would you would you learn the trombone so you can take your brother's spot when you leave? And so then he, you know, he probably took about ten minutes to learn the trombone, and then he started <laughs> playing with us. It's amazing how good that dude sounds on everything he plays, man. Yeah. Cool. So you've got. Uh yeah, some longtime members of the band still around after all these years. Yeah, like the really the core of the band has been with us for you know twenty years. I mean Jordan, um, yeah, Jordan, uh, and uh, it's only like we've got a couple. And Darren's been with us for you know that long. I mean, yeah. you know, like he started with us when he was in high school. It's just now that we're starting to have a couple of young younger cats who are like in their early twenties play with us. Um, so yeah, it's pretty, it's a definitely like the core group has been together for a very long time. Yeah. And one thing I like about you guys, it's like, it feels like you guys have always thought of things like a band. I, and, and I only say that because I've played a lot with Jack Brass Band and Jack Brass Band really thinks of it more like, um, I don't know even how to describe it, a corporate entity that, that, uh, that, uh, you know, will 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 have like a on on the Fourth of July, for instance. They'll be like Jack Brass Band A band, Jack Brass Band B uh-huh. band, Jack Brass Band C band, Jack uh-huh. Brass Band D band. <laughs> it'll be like all these different platoons right. of Jack Brass, uh, and it'll be like all licensed out. And you know, it's, it feels very corporate. Right, it's right. like when you're dealing with like uh, what music to record and rehearsing and all that stuff. It just feels like a business uh-huh. more than a band. And uh, I like that you guys have taken this. I mean, at least with you guys, and it, correct me if I'm wrong. Like, it feels like you guys have focused on it being a band and writing yeah. original music and playing the music from the the tradition. Yep. Uh, but like a lot of original shit too. Yeah. So no, that that is yeah. I think that's I think that's fair. We we do. Um, we love playing with each other. And the other thing is that um, I think that we really like our focus has always really been about playing new orleans brass but like learning the craft of new orleans brass band music like mm-hmm. um and you know it's interesting because we we did this when we started and i know a lot of brass bands are popping up all over the place and the first thing you read in their band bio including us a long time ago was like we're bringing some new flavor to this music and like <laughs> you know what no not really yeah. Uh, but th- to, to us, there's just like, there's something that's just really honest about like, we are learning this craft because it's an incredibly important tradition right. and we want to learn the language of New Orleans brass band music. And you can yeah. hear it in the way that we play. Like, you know, um, that's not to say that we don't write, we might bring some kind of like little slightly different, you know, way of doing things. Um, because you know, we're not from New Orleans. We have a different, you know, musical, you know, loves and passions up here, but we do speak the language. And so when you listen to us, it's like you, you know, you can tell that we've spent years honing this craft of brass band music and not, and not doing, you know, a different trying to combine brass band with something like this is what we're doing. Yeah. And I so, think there's a lot of bands now that are that, like you said, like are an update to the brass band. And, and yeah, I see that. Like a lot of my students are like into, into, uh, yeah, uh, Lucky Chops. You know, people, mm-hmm. bands like that. And like I hear a band like Lucky Chops, and I hear zero New Orleans in their sound. Like I don't hear any. So I so then I go like, well, this isn't really a, like. What do you mean brass band? Like this isn't really a 
that there's none of the tradition in their sound at all. And it's like being a jazz musician. It's like you learn the you learn the early stuff and you study that and then you make your own music. But right. you know, it's like there's that foundation of like right. knowing the knowing the shit, knowing the yeah, language I mean, you as you're saying. The, you know, you still know the changes to Olio and you, but you know, yeah. um, there, I, I just, I feel like with brass band, there's just like, like if you're going to be able to play like the brass band funk, well, the rebirth stuff, you have to be able to be pretty competent on the traditional stuff. And I think that also a lot of times bands skip over that and they get really excited by the soul rebels and the, and the, and rebirth. And they skip over like where that came from. And some of the, you know, some of the stylistic choices that came from the older stuff and moved into the younger stuff. And I just think that, um, to, to have a brass band sound as good as it can, I think yeah. you need to really kind of like absorb all of that and like understand the vocabulary. Yeah. And those bands play, I mean, those bands record trads, man. Like there's yeah. a bunch of rebirth recordings of, of older tunes. Uh, there's a hot eight recording that we've, we've been listening to St. James infirmary, mm -hmm. hot eight playing the dirge portion of that. Yep. Um, uh, Actually, we're playing uh, Eight Kicking It Live on their uh, from their new record oh, really? uh, in my band here. We're going to perform it on uh, Friday. Uh, I love it. I love fun. that you're doing that with those young cats. Man, it's it's been so great, and it's such a it's such an easy teaching tool. It's like mm -hmm. here's this great music that's really fun. Mm -hmm. Let's learn it by ear. You know, it's like let's throw on a recording. And some of them, like early on, I'll teach it. I'll actually like take my horn out and I'll yeah. play each part and I and we'll just do it um to get them going but yeah. then it's like then it's like let's listen to some recordings get your ears around this get your ears yes. around that I mean it's it's amazing to hear like I had a snare drum player come in this year who played in a New Orleans style brass band in Minneapolis um and just like came in and like really didn't understand mm -hmm. what the snare drum is supposed to do mm -hmm. and we talked a whole bunch and I play a bunch of drums now and so like i would sit and play with him but the big thing was like i was like man you gotta be you have to be listening to this all the time just get it get it yes. in your ears you know and over the course of the last three or four weeks it's like he's a completely different snare drum player uh -huh. and it's really fun as an educator to yeah. see that happen and to see them kind of take it what, what what i've seen happen is that these students take ownership of the thing because there's no sheet music there's no like me conducting and being like you played that note yes. wrong it's not like that it's like Let's check. Let's all check out this great recording. You know, I was I've been working out a bunch, and in the mornings I, I'll listen to the new Hot Eight, and so like that was the song that I was like, man, I think we should play this tune. You know, mm -hmm. um, and so we started learning it, and it's like it's that vibe. And now they're learning tunes, man. At first it took forever. It's like now they're learning tunes in ten minutes. Like to learn a trad, ten minutes they learn it. You know, I love it. Super yes. cool. Um, no, I, I, I think that I think that ear thing is also so important because that's that's where that's where you listen. That's where you start to hear all the little nuances and all the little pickups that like the trumpet players play. Just all the you know everybody yeah. you know, um, and you you can't write that on you know if you're reading you're not you're not hearing that stuff and yeah. so that's it's so, style so it's key. inflection it's groove and it's notes all at mm -hmm. the same time yeah you know when you're reading written music it's just notes on a page it's right it's just notes and rhythms and it's not it's not even teaching you about groove really it's right it's like this is the notes and where to place them but like how do you feel that and it's like when you learn from a recording it's like obvious right uh maybe maybe not to some though i mean it's like <laughs> It's really the way, and it's interesting because I came. I remember coming into Lawrence University as a student uh -huh. and being given these like orchestral excerpts, uh -huh. and where I felt it was normal for me to like go check out recordings when I was learning jazz. I wasn't doing that with these orchestral excerpts, and I performed them and my as like my audition into the program or whatever when I first got there, uh -huh. and my teacher was like, "Have you ever heard any of these?" You know, and I was like. Yeah, it's busted, you know, and it's like, obviously it's as important to get your ears around the orchestral yes. shit too, but it's like, I didn't, I just never even associated that with listening because for me it was always like, you play the notes on the page and it says right there what you're supposed right. to do with dynamics and it's like, you don't really know what it sounds like until you go to the, get with the tapes. Yes. You know, it's funny. I, um, about a year ago, I asked a friend, who you, you also know Eric Johnson, trombone yep. player. Yeah. I said, Eric, I feel like. I, I want you to like loan me like five or 10 albums that from like 1995 to like 2005, maybe 2010, like 
loan me some like real like really important like pop rock records um because i didn't really listen to anything but brass band music for like that decade yep. and so like he gave me like nirvana and you know all this other stuff because i didn't i just didn't i didn't really deal with this other music because i was just so immersed in the brass band thing and yep. you know um so that's why it just sort of like seeped in me yeah yeah and that's that's invaluable man and like i I feel like if you're going to learn a, a musical language at a deep level, there has to be a period of time where you block everything else out and you uh -huh. just like, that's how I was from 2002, 2003 to like 2007, 2008, uh -huh. where like I only listened to jazz music. It was like only yes. fr from Louis Armstrong to Dave Douglas and Ingrid Jensen, you know, it was like, it was only in that realm of like trumpet jazz, you know, yep. <laughs> and like, yep. And that's cool, like, that's cool, uh, but I do, I remember being, like, people talking about recordings and being like, I don't even know what you're talking yes. about, man. I haven't listened to the radio. I haven't checked out anything outside of what I've been into right. for but years. Now we, but we can, and now we can hear it in your trumpet playing. <laughs> yeah, well, that's the idea. <laughs> that's the idea. Although I constantly go, like, man, I got all these holes to fill. You know, there's still... I know. This is such I a know. lifelong journey you know i still need to sit down with a flaming lips record i mean i just there's so many <laughs> gaps in my <laughs> <laughs> yeah what fell on you too what record is that, is that a record? oh that's a yeah this is a lewis armstrong and, and eddie condon live at newport oh there you go nice man yeah pops i spent a lot of time with pops but mm -hmm. uh but not as much time with like charlie parker or dizzy gillespie it's like i, I really that's where i gotta go now is like mm -hmm. i gotta really learn that bebop shit get a little more get a little more of that in my language that's where i'm i'm also thinking about like writing songs and singing and like all these other things yeah. <laughs> you know it's like there's like much really into that as well but there's also like there's this part of me that's like man i really got to dig deep into the beatbox it's thing. not a race though we got time <laughs> i suppose man i don't know my dad died at 59 so I'm, i always have this oh, mindset yeah. like man i gotta okay i gotta take fair. care of some shit i'm 4 yeah. 38 it's like maybe i got time i mean like that's why i'm also trying to take care of myself physically just like be working out more and eating better and yeah all of that but uh i definitely uh you know it's like i wonder i got that in the back of my mind like never know how much time you got left man that's true i mean i know you know i know a lot of i mean that's that's one thing about you know i think about a lot of the new orleans guys and you know who've died pretty young or had yeah. really serious health complications and you know living that lifestyle of a new orleans brass band musician is really hard and they you know they play hard and they go hard and they get you know they stay up late do a second line then go play a gig afterwards and you know it just kind of wears on them and yeah. so you know they've you know quite a number of them have passed um you know with that circumstance and others but um yeah i mean it is definitely important to like you know focus on health um i you know i remember um, first time I read that Sonny Rollins used to run every night, um, I started on a little running thing where I would run down State Street at night because I wanted to keep my body healthy like Sonny did. Yeah. You know, I'm not doing that anymore, but. <laughs> <laughs> I was running this morning, man. I did uh, 30 minutes on the treadmill. And okay, that's good. lunges and leg lifts and things. Legs Tuesday, Thursdays for me. Oh, nice. And cardio. Um yeah, cool, man. So I, you know, I've also heard that you're like the king of the side hustle, and that you've got, you've had like <laughs> eBay shit. I'm just curious, like, what yeah. have your side hustles looked like? Because I think there's a lot of people that listen to this podcast that are probably like, they want to be full time music, and if they can yeah. come up with some kind of side hustle that makes them a few hundred bucks a month, yeah, or you know, between three and six hundred bucks a month, it's like that's enough for some people to pay rent, and then they could be free to do their music so like what what, what have your side yeah. hustles been like so i think well part of it is that i you know my adhd has been is just been kind of like my friend and my foe for a long time um it allows me to be able to juggle many things at once hmm. um it's also incredibly frustrating to people like my wife and others yeah. who <laughs> have to live with it uh mm -hmm. But yes, I do kind of have a lot of sticks in the fire. Like I have, you know, Mama Dig Downs and also the Southside Aces traditional um, jazz band in yep. Minneapolis. Um, I buy and sell um, men, like vintage men's clothes um, hmm. on eBay that I pick up at the thrift store. Um, and, and then you and sell, sell them on eBay. Yeah. And okay. that's, you know what? It's a perfect 
uh, it's it would be it's perfect for a musician to do because it's kind of like on your time. Yeah. Um, you can do it from anywhere. You can do it from the road, um, and you can make some pretty good money every month. Um, Interesting. I also Did have you... a barbie. I also have a barbecue business. I do some catering in the summer, and then I'm also you know work as a social worker. So oh, have you, you thought about, about, well, I was going to ask a question. Of, yeah. Is it like, do you have a niche for the clothing thing? Is it big, big, big and tall? Like did I hear that at some point that you focused on like l- people, cause oh. you're tall, you're a very tall person. Is it like no, you focus on? I did for a while. Like if I would see like real big guy jeans, like 46 waist, like I always would buy them and I just kind of saw them inside. I always pick them up and they sell really fast. Oh. Um, but I just, you know, I just, I kind of have, you know, I've done it for about seven or eight years now. Um, you know, I used the money I made to like remodel our kitchen and, uh, wow. I bought, I bought, uh, um, I bought our piano, our Yamaha piano for the house. I bought my wife and I bikes. Um, and then in two summers from now, we're going to go to, uh, I'm going to take, uh, the four of us, my kids and my wife, we're going to go to, um, France, Spain and Morocco. Um, and so I've got like some savings targets built in there and that's from the eBay money. So, Holy smokes. Yeah. Man. I mean, um, yeah, so it, it can work. You can make it work for sure. Are you looking for specific brands or are you just like, if it looks nice, you get it or yeah, I, yeah, I'm kind of sp- focused on specific brands. You just kind of figure out over time, like what's hot. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I mean, anything Patagonia is really hot. Um, you know, there's some jeans like lucky jeans, lucky brand jeans sell really well for guys. Um, there's also, a, there's also this company in Bloomington that sells, I think they provide a lot of NFL apparel to hmm. teams. And when they, they bring their extras to the Salvation Army. So I'll just like find practice jerseys from like the, you know, the Bills or the Vikings and those really so sell really well. Interesting. So, yeah. It's just, it's just kind of like, you know, it's just a matter of just finding out kind of what's hot and, you know, styles change. I don't really deal that much with women's clothes a little bit. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a, it's a good hustle. Cool, man. Tell me, tell me more about the barbecue business. Like, are you, have you thought about, do you have like sauces you've made and stuff too? Yeah. Although yes. So my friend Joel and I, we bought a huge smoker. Like when you pull behind your car Mm -hmm. or your truck, we bought it about 15. Like I've seen down in New Orleans guys on Frenchman street selling jerk chicken. Yeah, exactly. Um, so we started, we start, we bought it. Um, about 15 or so years ago and we catered a bunch of parties and back then we we're making our own sauce. Mm. Um, but now like, because w- since we had kids, like we kind of stopped doing it. We had even, you know, done some art fairs and sold sandwiches. Um, and now, you know, it's not quite to that level that it was, but I still, you know, people hire me for different, you know, graduation parties or whatever. Um, and, uh, I don't know. In a lot of ways, it's the same. It's, it's, it's like, it's like being in a band. It's like, you're sort of bringing people together. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, um, you know, food in, in a lot of ways is like music. And so, Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know how to do it and I know how to like make people feel good. And, um, you know, making delicious barbecue is kind of like playing a badass brass band tune in in a lot of ways. Hell yeah, man. So love that. Yeah. And it feeds my ADHD. I have to do something. (laughs) <laughs> so uh okay tell me what you got coming up so you, I, you got a michael jackson thing yeah yes we have been working on this uh this album brass jackson arranged by nat mcintosh um for a long time um and, and we are within striking distance of it being done so um it'll be you know it'll definitely be a 2023 release um but we've been working on it for like a decade now wow. um so and it's it's fan, the music that's fantastic i mean there's something about michael's melodies that really translate well to um to brass band mm-hmm. um i am a huge prince fan i that's my that's my favorite musician in the world prince and rebirth brass band prince's music does not translate as well to um to brass band as michael's does there's right. um so anyway so nat has nat has um came up with 11 arrangements um working day and night black or white um they don't really care about us um why you want to trip on me Mm -hmm. um those are all in the mix and uh and it's we're close on it so it's gonna be called brass jackson and the funny thing about the name brass jackson is back when we were naming the band rock and i 
almost 30 years ago, were throwing around different ideas for, for names. And he said, how about Mama Dig Down's Brass Band? I was like, oh, that sounds pretty good. I like that. And he goes, no, what about Mama Dig Down's Brass Jackson? I was like, what the hell's a Jackson? <laughs> I said, okay, how about, how about like conjunction, junction, what's your function? Like, what if it was Mama Dig Down's Brass Junction? He goes, all right, I like that. I like that better. So we rolled with Mama Dig Down's Brass Junction for the first like four years. And then which we is like, a mouthful, oh, man. That's, that's... Let's get rid of Junction. We're, we're a brass band. Yeah, yeah, So yeah. now we're going all the way back to... Circling back. Circling back to the convo we had 30 years ago, and it's Mama, and this will be called uh, Brass Jackson. Nice. I like it. Cool, man. Well, here's what we'll do. We'll we'll link all your stuff in the show notes. Anybody that wants to check out Mama Dig Down's Brass Band, we'll put that stuff in the show notes. Maybe awesome. we'll link your eBay channel too, man. <laughs> People want to... Get people want to buy LL some bean boots before the before the snow flies, or just go to or just go to Goodwill, I guess, yes. uh, and and start that hustle yourself for sure. Uh, thanks, man. I appreciate you taking the time no, to chat. Uh, uh, I want to redo on our conversation the other day. My kids were nuts. I'm sorry, my wife was out of town, but I would love to talk to you more about release strategy for that. Yes, uh, I would love. Record. I've already I've already learned a lot from you just on the, listening to the pod, but uh, I'd love to take a deep dive on that because I want to make sure that when we release this, that it gets in front of as many ears as possible. Yeah, yeah, we'll we'll uh, we'll talk about it. I've been thinking about it a bunch. Okay, cool. Hey, yeah, I appreciate thanks, the time and thanks for caring so much about this music. Absolutely, brother. You too, man. All right. Peace. Hey, thanks so much for listening to my conversation with Eric Jacobson. If you're looking for more, please like and subscribe wherever you listen. If you're listening on YouTube, like and subscribe to the channel. If you are listening on Apple Podcasts and you could rate the show five stars and then write a little review that's like, hey, I really like this show. You should listen. That helps. That puts it in other people's feeds, which will help us grow, which will help us keep getting better guests. All right. So keep at it. If you love the show, tell your friends. That really helps us out. We've got a Facebook page called Geek Boss Podcast you can join. We still have a deal with Ari's Take Academy. So if you're looking to take some courses on how to do things like sync licensing or like running ads on Facebook or Instagram for your music, really helpful things that the best people in, in the industry are teaching. Ari's Take Academy has those courses for you. If you enter Gig Boss, G-I-G-B-O-S-S, at checkout, you'll get 10% off whatever course you purchase. The links are below in the description. People have been asking for a playlist of all the musicians that come on our podcast, and I have created one. The Gig Bosses playlist is now live on Spotify, so you can grab that link in the description as well and start listening to all the guests that come on the Gig Boss podcast because they're all badasses. They're amazing. That's why they're on this podcast. All right? So check them out, listen to that music, get inspired, and keep going. Keep going. The key is to keep going. All right? I'm rooting for you. I want you to, I want you to be successful. I'm rooting for you. Keep going. Thanks again for listening, and I'll see you on the next one.